I'd like for us to have a word of prayer before I begin the message uh, tonight. And I had indicated this morning that we would change the order of the Sunday evening service a little bit uh, this evening so that uh, we might have adequate time for worship and communion at the close of the service. And I'll begin my message uh, right early on after the service had just begun. And we'll do that to keep our word. We recognize that some people will be gathering in yet. So uh, just uh, feel at home. Let them take their seats as they come. Let's uh, open our heart, though, to the Lord as we ask his blessing upon our time together tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we realize when we approach the subject of nuclear holocaust that a sentence of death rests upon the whole world, that uh, literally in a moment's uh, time, uh, major cities could go up in fire and the world itself within a matter of hours could be destroyed. Never in the whole history of the human race have we had the kind of firepower to destroy the planet as exists now. And even as there is a sentence of death that hangs over the whole human race because of the nuclear potential and possibilities, there is also a sentence of death that hangs over all persons that only your cross can mitigate and can spare from. And so we come to you, Lord, this evening because you are a merciful God and because long ago, before men ever had the firepower, you could have destroyed the world. Indeed, you destroyed it once by water and will destroy it yet again by fire. We come to you in whom is our strength and our hope, in whom is all mercy. And we acknowledge you, our Lord. We're glad that we can sing songs in a troubled time that speak of you as our solid rock and that our hope is in you and that you're so great. You're above any power. You're beyond and above the power of the United States and its armaments. You're above and beyond the power of the Soviet Union and all the combined powers of this world. Your word is truth. Your word is powerful. You created the worlds and you've reserved for yourself the right to end them. We thank you that in you we live and move and have our being, that our hope is not in any political solution to problems on the horizon today, that our hope is not in some strategic negotiations that may occur, but our hope is in you, and you are the God who does all things well. Give us, Lord, a spirit of peace this evening as we consider this vital topic before us. We ask in the name of our Lord, amen. This is the fourth in the series on the Christian faces the issues. We have looked already at the Christian facing the issue of humanism and homosexuality and abortion, and tonight another issue that faces Christians today, the issue of nuclear armament. Perhaps there's no more polarizing issue in the world today than the issue of nuclear armament. And of course, I think we're all familiar with sights and sounds of the peace movement and of the voices on the other side that are calling for a credible nuclear deterrence. When evangelicals, born again Christians, speak on this issue, they do not all speak with one voice, as we will see tonight. I was helped greatly in preparation for this message by reading Michael Novak's book, Moral Clarity in a Nuclear Age. Michael no Novak is a Catholic scholar and his book responds to the pastoral letter of the bishops of the United States in respect to the uh, Catholic bishops uh, called to the United States in regard to nuclear armament. And Michael Novak makes uh, three very uh, critical points about the three spheres of gospel teaching as they apply to human life. He applies them to the history of Catholic doctrine, but I'll transpose a few words as we go along and, and uh, change them to application to evangelical thought on the subject of the Christians in the nuclear age. He says, uh, first of all, that the first sphere of gospel teaching regards the life of the spirit, human life in the light of eternity. Therefore, when the scriptures, or his term was when the bishops speak, on issues that have to do with the human spirit, with human life in the light of eternity, they speak with clear and supreme authority. We would simply translate that to say that when the scriptures speak to us in a clear way in regard to eternal life and how we may obtain eternal life, they speak with clear authority and are not uh, therefore a matter of uh, discussion as to whose opinion is better than another. Obviously, when the scriptures speak clearly in the area of eternal matters, they speak with finality. A second sphere of gospel teaching, Michael Novak points out, is areas in the social order in which the gospels and uh, Catholic teaching, his words, speak and touch. 
Uh, for example, he is talking about encyclicals that come out through the papacy or through uh, national or through international councils of bishops, which declared church teaching in areas ranging all the way from abortion to birth control to world peace to nuclear disarmament and the like. And his position is that when the church speaks in its teaching office in one of these areas of social application of the gospel to human life, it also speaks with authority, albeit there may be some ambiguity when it speaks. There is this, of course, pattern as well when we apply the teaching of the scriptures not only to issues of eternal life, our salvation, but these past weeks we've taught, uh, tried to teach the scriptures as they relate to issues like humanism and abortion and homosexuality. And we have uh, sought, therefore, to make application from the scriptures to the social order of man. And we've uh, indicated that when the scriptures speak again very clearly in these areas that we need to give heed to them. The third level of gospel teaching, however, that Michael Novak points out is the what he calls the worldly interpretation of social reality and fact, tactical and strategic judgment oriented to results in the concrete world of history, choices among various possible means, practical detail, and in general questions of prudential judgment. How do you like those words? I just love to read Catholic scholars because they have a history of tradition to speak from and every word is a, is a 10 megaton kind of a word that has meanings within its own context of historical uh, theological interpretation. Basically, what Michael Novak is saying at this point in our lay language is that there are matters f open for us for a prudential judgment, where the decision or the recommendation does not come to us, in his case, from bishops or from popes, or in our case, from the scripture, but is a matter left to the individual reasoning of Christians responsible fulfilling, for fulfilling their calling in this world. A great statement that he makes is, in this third sphere, the God of the last judgment will not be satisfied by a claim that a Christian followed the general authority of his bishop or anyone else. Each will be judged by what he or she did in the light of his or her own concrete moral reasoning in particular cases. From such personal responsibility, there will be no escape in the encompassing light of the final judgment. And I think, therefore, Novak has a point that there are certain issues we speak on where what is at stake is prudential judgment, what is prudent. And the church may speak to us to inform us of basic principles, but in the last analysis, it is a matter that does not separate Christians from non-Christians, but it is a matter for Christians themselves to decide which way they are going to go on the issue. I say that at the beginning because uh, born-again Christians uh, do have differing positions on the Christian's response to nuclear armaments. And it seems to me that this is rightly a matter of prudential judgment. In fact, there is a Sunday school class, the Forum Sunday school class on Sunday mornings uh, that uh, analyzes the previous Sunday night sermon and has a kind of a debate and discussion about it. I haven't been able to make any of those classes, but uh, certainly that class is more free to discuss this subject than they were the other three subjects, which I understood they went ahead and freely discussed anyway. But be that as it may, that's the kind of church that we have where a Sunday school class can meet the next week and tear the pastor's sermon apart. I, it's kind of nice. I sort of enjoy that give and take. Matters of prudential judgment I place before you. And simply what I will say this evening will be to reflect an evangelical position, first of all, that calls for unilateral or one-sided nuclear disarmament, and then attempt as an individual and private Christians to raise some object objections to that point of view. I speak tonight not as an expert in nuclear armaments. You could immediately recognize that I would have no time to be an expert in that area. Nor do I speak as a scientist, because I'm not one. Nor do I speak as a military strategist. But I simply speak as a humble Christian wrestling with the issue of nuclear armament and what, if anything, the scripture has to say to us about it. I want to begin by presenting to you the case for unilateral nuclear disarmament as proposed by evangelical authors Ron Sider and Richard K. Taylor in their book, Nuclear Holocaust and Christian Hope. Uh, Ron Sider is professor at uh, Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary and president of Evangelicals for Social Action. He is a close friend, as you may recognize by the name Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary of Tony Campola, who a few weeks ago spoke to a youth pastor's conference in this pulpit, and I happened to drop in and over here, and basically their positions on unilateral nuclear armament are, are similar, uh, if probably identical to one another, a call for one-sided unilateral disarmament. Uh, Richard K. Taylor is uh, uh, presently 
a member of uh, the Sojourners, a consultant to Sojourners magazine, a kind of avant-garde evangelical magazine. I might just uh, mention as well that Ron Sider comes uh, from a Mennonite church tradition, and the Mennonites stretching all the way back to the Anabaptists of Europe have historically been pacifist in their approach. Ron Sider, at the beginning of his book, raises three questions, and I'll, in raising the questions, give you the answers he provides and then the rationale as to why he does this. His first question is simply, can Christians support government policies which rely on the threat of nuclear war? Sider and Taylor's position basically is that no Christian should support a government policy that relies on the threat of nuclear war. In fact, not only is nuclear war immoral, but even the possession of nuclear weapons of itself is an immoral act. Second question which the book raises is, given the realities of modern war and the ethics of Jesus, that is, the ethics of Jesus in terms of non-retaliation and non-violence, given the ethics of Jesus Christ, can followers of Jesus Christ support or engage in war of any form? And the answer again to that question from their perspective would be no. The only option permissible for a Christian is a pacifist position. The third question is, how can Christians act for peace in today's world? And then Sider and Taylor spell out a number of alternatives that evangelical Christians ought to be carrying on to act for peace in the world today. As you open the book, they, first of all, and, and I think probably of the literature that is out, do the best job of describing for us what nuclear war would really do to the planet. And to sufficiently sober us up, I would like to read a few selections out of this, just in case anyone is in doubt as to the terrible destructiveness of the firepower, firepower that is in the world today. Their first chapter is called The First Hour, and it deals with uh, a USA-launched uh, blast uh, occurring over Moscow. Perhaps the United States has launched it as a defensive uh, mechanism, but it, it shows anyway what is going to happen. And uh, here is how the book begins. An instant after the one megaton warhead exploded over Moscow, a huge fireball burst upward. At its center, the temperature was 150 million degrees Fahrenheit, more than eight times the heat at the center of the sun. See, man can create heat hotter now than the sun. In central Moscow, life came to an end. The fireball itself was three-fourths of a mile wide. It vaporized steel and concrete buildings, roads, bridges, and hundreds of thousands of people. Mingled in the raging cauldron, the structures and bodies, pulverized and reduced to cinders, were, sucking, were sucked up into a towering mushroom-shaped cloud. Moments later, the heavier rubble, now highly radioactive, fell back onto the shambles below. Lighter particles rose with the mushroom cloud into the upper atmosphere, from which they would later descend as radioactive dust. That is the first two paragraphs of the book. The awesome destruction of the nuclear weaponry is seen further in the second chapter, which talks about the awesome destruction of nuclear arms. On August, 18, or August 6, 1945, the American B-29 bomber, Enola Gay, dropped a 13 kiloton atomic bomb on Hiroshima. It flattened the city and killed 130,000 people. Today, the world's atomic weapons hold a lethal equivalent of over two tons of dynamite for every man, woman, and child on Earth. Think of that for a moment. Two, how many? Two tons, that's 4,000 pounds of dynamite for every man, woman, and child living on the planet Earth. Or 853,000 Hiroshima's. Sider and Taylor go on to point out the studies that have been done in the event of nuclear war. The U.S. Office of Technological Assessment, a government office, has attempted to conjecture a number of scenarios. One scenario is a limited nuclear exchange between the United States and Russia, which hit only oil refineries. That is, the purpose of the, uh, of the target was just simply oil refineries, no civilian targets, uh, no military targets were aimed at. Given this uh, limitation, within the first hour, the report of the U.S. Office of Technological Assessment concluded that the Soviet attack would kill three to five million Americans. The American attack would kill one to five million Soviet, one to one and a half million Soviet citizens. 64% of the U.S. oil refining capacity and 73% of Soviet capacity would be wiped out. The American economy with heavy dependence upon petroleum would be shattered. A study was done by the same office on limited attack on each country's military installations. 
Of course, a more, up, up, uh, more full-scale attack than simply limited to oil refineries. It concluded that under the best manageable circumstances, more than a million people would die in each country. In less favorable circumstances, aiming at military targets, which we realize are all over the Midwest, it's not just the West Coast and the big cities of the East Coast that are vulnerable, it's places like Omaha, Nebraska, and, and places in Colorado and Wyoming. But in, in the least favorable, or in less favorable circumstances, 20 million would die in the United States and 10 million in the USSR. Reason for less casualties in the USSR is they're better prepared for nuclear blasts with the extensive development of bomb shelters and also the use of the subway systems in major uh, Soviet areas for uh, secondary purposes of bomb fallouts. Large portions of both countries would be covered by radioactive fallout, which would cause sickness and death for years to come. The uh, U.S. Office of Techno Technological Assessment did one further study, and that is what full-scale nuclear war would be where they simply go all out for one another to not only destroy oil refineries and, uh, and military installations, but go out for uh, civilian centers, population centers like Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., New York City, Chicago, etc. In the event of a full-scale nuclear war, uh, you would see casualties of 70 million to 160 million Americans and up to 100 million Soviet citizens. If population centers as well as military and economic targets were hit, American deaths could even go as high as 190 million people, 86 percent of our total population. As many as 130 million Soviet people would die. The deaths would be accompanied by incomprehensible levels of injuries and the physical destruction of a high percentage of both countries' economic and industrial capacities. Uh, Sider and Taylor also do a little graph that's a fascinating analysis of destructive power. They note that the amount of energy released by 1,000 tons of dynamite, TNT, equals one kiloton. The power of the warhead that destroyed Hiroshima was 13 kilotons. The U.S. Minuteman III warhead is 510 kilotons. One megaton bomb is 1,000 kilotons. The equivalent destructive power of all bombs dropped in World War II was 3,000 kilotons. The equivalent destructive power of all United States bombs dropped during the Vietnam War was 4,000 kilotons. A Soviet SS-19 missile, which is not the most updated missile, the Soviets have recently placed SS-20 missiles in Europe, but a Soviet SS-19 missile has 5,000 kilotons. A U.S. Titan II missile has 10,000 kilotons. The missiles in United States and Soviet submarines have 1,502,000 kilotons. Atomic bombs in United States and Soviet long-range bombers have 2,224,000 kilotons. Warheads on U.S. and Soviet land-based missiles, ICBMs, have 7,363,000 kilotons, and the total United States and Soviet long-range nuclear arsenal contains 11,089,000 kilotons of firepower. An impressive destructive capacity by every imagination. There are three basic ways that the United States and the Russians operate with nuclear armaments. One is from missile-firing submarines, which cruise the oceans of the world. The United States, at, at least count that is releasable, and who knows how many, how accurate these figures are, because of national secrets in both the United States and Russia. The U.S. is reported to have 41 nuclear submarines. Between the United States and NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance, there are 5,000 submarine atomic warheads ready to be deployed. The Russia has 64 nuclear subs with 1,200 subatomic warheads. It takes 15 minutes from launch to target for a missile to come out of the water in the ocean from a submarine and hit any target in the U.S. or in Russia. In addition to missile firing submarines, which are a threat to both countries, there are land-based missiles. Russia has 1,398 intercont intercontinental ballistic missile systems a half or more of them carrying three or more atomic warheads called MIRVs, multiple independently targetable reentry vehicles, which simply means a rocket goes up and it has a cluster of bombs on it which can be targeted for any number of directions. And of course, modern weaponry is so accurate now that you can literally hit a dime 7,000 miles away. The U.S. Uh, uh, fired two weeks ago in the Pacific uh, about a 7,000-mile shot that successfully stopped an incoming intercontinental ballistic missile that they were uh, playing with in terms of a war games to see how good our defense uh, strategies were. These ICBMs from Russia, 
1,398 of them are aimed at the United States. Over 5,000 atomic bombs on these ICBM uh, noses. There are 1,502 United States ICBMs aimed at Russia with over 2,000 nuclear warheads. In addition to submarines and land-based missiles, there are bombers and air-launched missiles, such as the cruise missile. In a full-scale war, the United States and Russia have a capacity to unload over 15,000 atomic bombs on one another. That's strategic weapons only, strategic weapons being described as those weapons which go from continent to continent, in contrast to tactical weapons which co come within a continent. We can destroy every major Russian city with our nuclear armaments 35 times, and they can destroy every one of our major cities 20 times. The current policy in uh, respect to nuclear armament is a policy of deterrence. It simply means that we need to keep building nuclear armaments in order to stay current and in order to deter uh, Russia. They need to keep developing to deter us because if either side ever got the advantage, the other side would fear that the game would be over. The idea behind this is what is called the MAD policy of deterrence, mutually assured destruction, M-A-D, meaning if you shoot us, at us, be prepared for the fact that you're going to pay for it, so you better not do it if you don't want it done to yourself. Uh, of course, uh, Sider and Taylor say that to even threaten to do this, to annihilate another nation with nuclear armaments and cause the kind of suffering that would be caused is of itself immoral. We should never even intend to do this. Yet nuclear deterrence philosophy is built upon intention. It is here that the Catholic scholar Michael Novak again helps greatly. And I cite a quote from his book uh, uh, about uh, moral clarity in the nuclear age. Quote, those who intend to prevent the use of nuclear weapons by maintaining a system of deterrence in readiness for use do intend to use such weapons, but only in order not to use them, and do threaten to use them, but only in order to deter their use. Novak goes on to talk about three kinds of levels of intentionality. The policeman who carries a weapon intends deterrence with that weapon, but he intends in intending deterrence, he intends not to use it. It is not the intention of the policeman to go out and fire it at somebody. He only carries it in the event that he needs it. He intends not to use it. But its actual use is governed by justice and the disciplines of his profession. A burglar, on the other hand, may carry a weapon, and he may, he may intend to use it if threatened, his use of it is conditional use, that is, if threatened, and if he uses it, it will be outside of justice. The third person that carries a weapon is the murderer. His is not a conditional intention. He intends to use it. His is a willful, unlawful use of it. Novak indicates that the policy of, of nuclear deterrence is built upon the idea of the policeman carrying the weapon. He carries that as a moral act to deter crime, to deter, deter a, a, aggression. It is not immoral for him to carry the weapon to defend himself and to defend the society he has been sworn to protect. It's interesting that um, Sider is sensitive to this issue. Sider and T Taylor are sensitive to this issue, and so in their book ultimately plead not only for nuclear disarmament, but for the total disarmament of all peacekeeping personnel, whether they are keeping the peace inside of a nation or keeping uh, the peace of a nation from outside uh, foreign enemies. The fundamental moral intention in nuclear deterrence is to never have to use the deterrent force. Part of the whole Christian undergirding of uh, the current policy of nuclear deterrence, and there are a great majority probably of evangelical Christians that are on the side of, uh, of a strong nuclear policy in the United States for a deterrence to the Soviet Union, part of that uh, feeling and part of the Catholic feeling toward this is based upon what has been called the just war tradition. It's through the centuries of the existence of the Christian church, a rather a uh, detailed moral philosophy has been worked out as to when a nation can be justified in going to war. That, a, that even as there is a just act of self-defense, there also is a just act of corporate defense for a nation when it gets involved in, uh, in, 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 an, uh, in resisting an unjust situation. 
and Cider notes uh, seven of the basic elements which all the moral theologians note about a just war position. And basically, Cider says when he notes these seven elements of a just war that they don't fit the nuclear age. I'll show you how he says this. A just war is one where war, first of all, is taken as a last resort. All other means have failed to stop the aggressor from doing evil. All other solutions are exhausted. Therefore, war is the last result. resort. If that is the case, then the war may be just. Secondly, a just war must have a just cause. The goals must be just, and the opponent must be unjust. You cannot fight a just war just to take somebody else's territory. You must be resisting evil. Your cause must be just. Third, you must have the right attitude toward the war for it to be a just war. Your attitude should be the restoration of justice and not retaliation. This, by the way, has marked both post-World War I and post-World War II American philosophy in the restoration of Europe and Asia, that our attitudes as the victors in that war was not to impose retribution, but to instead seek uh, for a rehabilitation and a restoration of justice. That's why when you look at the Eastern Bloc, their economy has never been rebuilt to the degree that Western Europe's economy has been rebuilt because America has basically had a, an attitude not of retaliation but of restoration of justice. Fourth necessary condition for a just war is a prior declaration of war. You just don't sneak up on somebody and start shooting. You act like a gentleman and you tell somebody when you're going to fight them. That's what made the invasion of Pearl Harbor so ignominious. As, as uh, Roosevelt said, it would be a day that would live in infamy. Why would he say that? Because yeah, the war had not been declared before it was launched, and that is reprehensible. The fifth characteristic of a just war is that there should be reasonable hope of success. It would not be a just war if a smaller country is sure that it's going to get licked when it fights the war and it sends undermanned troops into a situation and it has no hope of success. There must be a reasonable probability that what you are fighting for will not be destroyed in the process. This is why we look at Iran and we just get so upset about the Ayatollah sending 13 and 14 year olds into battle unarmed as human waves because that kind of thing offends our sensitivity to what is involved in a just war, that it must have a reasonable hope of success. A sixth characteristic of a just war throughout the history of Christian tradition has been non-combatant immunity. That is, civilians, persons that are not directly engaged in the battle, ought to be given a degree of immunity, realizing, of course, that there are always going to be civilian casualties and the like, but there should not be a specific targeting of civilians. There should be non-combatant immunity. And then the last principle in a just war is proportionality. Proportionality. That is, the good results of the war are expected to exceed the, evil, the horrible evils involved. What you want to gain from the war will be greater than the evil that you resisted. Cider simply points out, and probably rightly, that in a nuclear war, these conditions simply cannot be met. At least only the first two conditions could be met. The others cannot be. The nuclear war would obviously be a last resort, and it may be for a just cause. But if you launch an all-out nuclear effort, then you cannot ever restore justice because the nuclear war of necessity brings retaliation. It really, there is no time to launch a prior declaration of the war. There is no reasonable hope of success because everybody's going to get wiped out. There will not be non-combatant immunity because civilian targets will most obviously be hit and be aimed at. And there can be no sense of proportionality because the horrible evil that is going to occur as a result of the nuclear holocaust is greater than any perceived good that could be gained from it. In addition to this, Cider raises three other objections to nuclear war. One is that if the U.S. drops the bomb on Russia, then we are involved in Christians killing Christians. Uh, and uh, if we claim to be a Christian country, we would recognize that there are many millions of people in the Soviet Union who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We would not want their blood on our hands, Sider says. Furthermore, he indicates that there are more persons in church in Russia on a, any given Sunday morning than there are all of Western Europe, supposedly our allies. That's a rather phenomenally interesting statistic. 
Another thing that Sider says is that the just war tradition has been notably ineffective in, pre in preventing unjust wars, and we need to hold, scrap the whole concept of the just war anyway. And then the last thing that he points out is that the church before Constantine did not support Christian participation in war. He has some lengthy references to early church fathers on the subject of pacifism in the early Christian community. At the close of his really argument on why we should unilaterally disarm, Sider ultimately then appeals to Scripture. I could not figure out in reading the book whether he appealed to Scripture last because his weakest argument came from the Scriptures or whether he appealed to it last because he was saving the best for the last. I haven't made up my mind on that. Perhaps by the time I'm done with my message, you will guess what I feel on that. Sider simply says, as you look at the New Testament, you cannot find a precedent for being involved in nuclear buildup to the extent that we are. Sider, in order to do this, must almost completely wipe out the whole tradition of the just war in the Old Testament context and simply say that the Old Testament established the nation of Israel for a specific mission at a specific place and its purpose has passed away with the coming of Christ and therefore different standards apply. He, say, he points us to the fact, to the idea that Jesus' nonviolent life and teaching is the way we should take. He especially dwells on Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48, which, where Jesus talks to us about not resisting the evil one, about if somebody compels you uh, to take their, your cloak, you ought to uh, give them your coat as well, that if they want you to go one mile, you should go with them too, that you should give to those who ask and those who beg you should also give to. Uh, there is to be, in the words of Jesus, no resistance to evil. Sider interprets this to mean non-violent. Resistance is allowed, but violent resistance is out. Jesus obviously non-violently resisted in his ministry. He non-violently overturned the tables of the money changers. He, uh, and really, in a sense, it was non-violent in that he didn't kill anything. Uh, he, uh, he was uh, nonviolent in his passive resistance to Pilate's authority, but he did resist. But he didn't resist in any kind of violent or physical way. Cider from this deduces that police need to develop nonviolent ways of restraining criminals and law courts should apply disciplinary rather than retributive justice. That's an important concept. It's part of the whole pacifist, coherent philosophy. When I term, use the term retributive justice, I need to define that in case that's a difficult word for you. Retributive justice, as distinguished from rehabilitative justice, simply means that when you give retribution, you're doing it because that person did wrong and they deserve three years and that's it. You serve three years in the pen. Your whole idea is you did a wrong and you pay the sentence, period. And Sider is basically saying that kind of justice is wrong from a New Testament and a moral sense. The kind of justice which the New Testament approves is rehabilitative justice, that if somebody needs to pay the consequences for an act, then you only uh, give them some kind of a sentence in order to have them go through a rehabilitative process. Further, Sider passage uh, takes Romans 13, which we dealt with this morning, and sets it in the context of Paul's urging non-retaliatory love toward hostile government officials. He closes the book by encouraging evangelical believers to take certain steps toward peace. He asks us to pray for peace. He asks us to reconcile interpersonal relationships. And I think that's an extremely valid point, that in talking about nuclear war, we need to recognize that there are many small world wars going on because we are a fallen people, and even Christians have wars with other Christians. We need to lay aside the wars and the conflicts. He tells us that we need to learn all we can about nuclear armaments, that we need to act, that we need to oppose military activity and plans, that we need to promote conscientious objectors, that we need to renounce military jobs. If you're working in a civilian military job, you need to pay the price as a Christian and not work in that job. He indicates that there should be permission for those who desire to withhold uh, some of their income tax uh, that the government is spending for national defense. He encourages the possibility of war tax resistance and that there be peace mission groups established in churches, political action committees, and he proposes a whole concept called transarmament, which would, transarmament is a term they have coined that would transform the United States from its present military system into a non-military defense system. This is called CBD, in contrast, I suppose, to CIA. But the CBD is civilian-based defense. 
and it would require large-scale participation, non-cooperation with injustice, refusal to kill, resistance to evil, and goodwill toward opponents. At the very close of the book, Sider is honest enough to face up to the consequences of what he is proposing, and he realizes that since the world has fallen, and since uh, that in would include uh, Soviet uh, mil the military apparatus, that such a, a, a call to the nation that would be heeded by America to unilaterally disarm and to form a civilian-based defense which would be non-military and would renounce all use of weapons would, would result in the invasion of America by the Soviet Union. He then, uh, and he talks about this, and if you wouldn't mind, are you interested in this? You want me to quote a little bit from the book? If you're not, I won't. Have I put you to sleep already? Are you there? Okay. I know this is getting a little thick, but I, I'd rather get to the core of the issue. And uh, whether you agree with Sider's position or maybe you don't know where I am at this point, that's okay. I'll get to that eventually. I think that this book is going to be the book read by evangelical college students in the next 10 years. <clears throat> and uh, and I, I really feel that as Christians, we part of our, our um, shall we say, responsibility to be informed Christians is to consider the effects that this may have on the generation that is coming. In the following description, however, we assume that the Soviet Union is the invader. If invaded, Americans would respond nonviolently. Two basic principles would underlie the stance of every American resisting aggression. The invaders, first, the invaders' orders are illegitimate and are not to be obeyed. Our allegiance is to our own constitutional system and to our God. We will follow our consciences and the laws passed by our democratically elected representatives. We will not follow the decrees of foreign despots who would alter our way of life without our consent. We will die rather than surrender. Two, the invaders' troops and functionaries are children of God made in his image. Therefore, we will not harm them, but will seek to show them goodwill. We will use every opportunity to convince them to give up their oppression. The initial invasion might be met by a nonviolent blitzkrieg, an all-out demonstration of our will to resist. A general work stoppage would be called. Masses of people would quietly fill the streets and go to the docks, airports, and other areas where enemy soldiers would be landing. The enemy's jumbo jets would disgorge heavily armed combat infantry, tanks, and armored cars. Parachute commandos would move quickly toward key points. Seaborne troops would spread out through coastal cities and towns. Behind them would come administrative staff with supplies to support further operations. The landings would be peaceful. No American artillery would fire. No jets would strafe. Instead of American soldiers crouching behind tanks and pointing guns at them, the invaders would see tens of thousands of unarmed people carrying signs with messages in the invaders' language. Go home. We won't harm you. Don't shoot. We are your brothers and sisters. Your life is precious. You are a child of God. Like the Czechs, Hungarians, and East Germans during the Russian invasion of these countries, Americans would climb up on tanks and try to talk to soldiers. Why have you come? Why are you invading a peaceful nation that is not threatening you? Loudspeakers would explain that the troops are welcome as tourists, but will be opposed as invaders. Demonstrators would hand out leaflets in the invaders' language, countering the propaganda they have been fed about the reasons for the invasion. The leaflet would explain that the invaders will not be harmed, but that Americans will suffer and die rather than give up their democratic way of life. Then he goes on to describe what the leaflet will say. And uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of other things that could be read. I think I've given you a sufficient idea of the scenario. Let me just uh, take a moment to, uh, to deal with some problems in, in this uh, scenario as I see it, and then come to wrestle a little bit with the biblical text. One of the problems with Sider's, four problems I see practically with Sider's position on unilateral disarmament and surrender to an invading force. One is that in spite of any attempt to meet uh, an invading force with nonviolent resistance, the Soviet Union may go ahead and nuke us anyway. And there would be no restraints on their use of power in such a case. That is, if uh, they simply do not like what uh, the Christians are doing in Southern California and they do not appreciate the nonviolent uh, way that we're resisting authority, rather than messing with us, simply pull their troops out and nuke Southern California. Uh, the problem is, in Sider's position, you still haven't dealt with the horrors of nuclear warfare. You have simply taken the weapons away from one side, and the other side then becomes totally free to use them at will. That's one of the massive problems that is, that is located in the peace movement and in Sider's book. A second kind of problem that is associated with Sider's position is that it assumes that clockwork order will prevail among American citizens in a time of panic that everybody's going to remember their leaflets and remember to do their thing. 
I have, as a, as a kid, was in Shanghai after the close of World War II, and even though that situation was beginning to stabilize, the tremendous panic in the citizenry, you cannot account for what people will do in a time of massive panic especially the non-redeemed part of the Christian community, and sometimes from watching Christians stand in line, waiting even to get in church, I'm not so sure that even the Christian community is totally redeemed. <clears throat> A third thing that Cider fails to do is to anticipate Americans turning against Americans. He is assuming that all the Americans will kind of march under the peace banner and show Christian love to their oppressors, which would be, it'd be great if, by the way, if Sider's idea could be pulled off, it would be a probably be a magnificent thing. Uh, we would convert the invading force, that's his scenario, four million, five million soldiers among 220 million Americans. They're gonna come in contact with our ideas. Russia's whole problem is it wants to isolate its citizens. In fact, it's just passed a new law that went into effect, I think, today or yesterday, that a Soviet citizen cannot house a non-Soviet citizen without prior police approval. Uh, so there's, you know, all of a sudden their citizens would be having contact. They would find out that we weren't monsters, all this kind of thing. But the one thing Cider doesn't account for is the fact that there are going to be quislings in America like there were in Norway. There are going to be people that turn against Americans, people in it for their own skin, for the buck that may be involved, for the power and the position that might be involved. That will compound problems. And perhaps one of the things that most notably he fails to mention is the tremendous violence that may and probably would be committed against persons. It is one thing for there to be uh, violence that occurs as a result of an act of war, but when there is violence against civilians with rape and murder of family members, then you're into a whole different scenario again. I, so I, I have some logical problems with Sider's position independent of the biblical reasoning that is employed, and I, I wanted just to be up front and mention that I had, I had those logical problems with his position. I'm, I'm uh, very attracted to slogans. I like slogans like the Christian's response should always be love rather than power and that love always wins the day and power never wins. That is very attractive and there is a great element of truth to that, but that, as we'll see, is not the whole truth of the matter. I have many problems with the biblical reasoning behind the pacifist position. At the same time, no one likes to be cast as a militarist. The real question before us as this issue is debated among evangelical Christians is what position is most likely to save lives, promote justice, and secure the peace? That's the issue. The issue even more than should we unilaterally disarm or should we continue to mount massive expenditures for nuclear deterrence, the issue that should lie as the moral base for the discussion is what position is in the long run the most likely to save lives promote justice, and secure the peace. In looking back historically at World War II, a question might be asked as to whether Hitler would have begun had he respected the threat of a strong deterrence. It was Neville Chamberlain's peace in our time philosophy that probably allowed the Holocaust to occur. There has not been a global war conflict in 40 years, precisely the length of time that there has been a nuclear deterrent. That fact is often, looked in the, over, off, often overlooked in the discussion. Looking at Sider's position from what I as an independent Christian, remember now when I speak on this issue tonight, I am not speaking with the authority of my office behind me. I'd like to make the Catholic distinction at this point, okay? That there is doctrinal authority that impinges upon eternal life. There is social application of the gospel in terms of our moral behavior that mandates how we behave in life. And then there is those matters of prudential judgment. I speak, therefore, as an individual Christian, having been invited by the pastor of the church to occupy the pulpit for this evening. <laughs> and there is... Uh, charity and freedom to, uh, I believe, among Christians to disagree on this issue and to have dialogue on it. Six confusions, it seems to me, from a biblical base in Cider and other positions that are like Cider's. One is a confusion between the individual and the state, a confusion between the individual and the state. Cider makes a great deal of Jesus' teaching on non-retaliatory, non-violent behavior from Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42 where the Lord is saying to us, do not resist evil, and if anyone asks you for something, give it to them. 
And uh, then he translates this into a universal activity for Christians that not only applies to all areas of individual behavior, but applies to all corporate or collective group activity. When we are a nation, we're to practice the same philosophy. When you look carefully, however, at Jesus' teaching about turning the other, turning the cheek if you're struck on the right cheek, and about giving something to someone who asks, you immediately recognize that Jesus himself intended some interpretations. For example, if your five-year-old child comes to you and asks you for the butcher knife, he's playing outside with his friends and says, Mommy, give me the butcher knife. And you say to him, I'm not going to give you the butcher knife because you might hurt yourself and your playmates. And he then promptly hauls out Matthew chapter 5 and says, Give to him who asks and do not refuse him who would borrow. Are you under obligation, therefore, under the literal rendering of that scripture by your five-year-old to nevertheless go ahead and give him the knife anyway? When Jesus talks about striking the right cheek, perhaps one of the simplest ways to understand that is that uh, if, and I maybe ought to have somebody up here when I'm preaching in the Sermon on the Mount before I've demonstrated this, but in order to hit somebody on the right cheek, I take a haymaker at them, right? If I take a haymaker at them with my right hand, what cheek do I hit them on? My le their left cheek. How do I, given the fact that most persons are normally right-handed and Jesus is using right, right cheek, how do you hit a person with the right hand on the right cheek? You can't do it in a solid blow like this. You do it in a backhand. It is a gesture of contempt. Jesus is telling us that when there's personal matters of contempt poured upon us, our matter, our response is to be one of non-retaliation. We do not have the right as Christians of individual personal vengeance. But Paul in Romans chapter 13, 1 to 7, where we were at this morning, talks about the fact that the state or the government is God's deacon, God's minister to execute God's wrath on the evildoer. That is, if a person comes up and strikes me as an individual person and blinds me for life because of his blow, if I understand the Sermon on the Mount correctly, I don't get up and uh, promptly slug him back. I mean, I don't have to take that response because God has appointed the government, the police, and the courts to fulfill the function of vengeance so that I do not wind up as a vigilante committee of one. And his wrath, his power of wrath, has been given to the state to execute justice. Paul goes on to say that the government does not bear the sword in vain. That is, even to the government, God has given the authority to take life when that life has acted in a, in a uh, capital kind of a crime or a capital offense. The bearing of the sword grants the state power, therefore, to defend itself from enemies within and from enemies from without. And it seems to me that there is a massive confusion on this subject between individual nonviolent response on a Christian when he is personally struck and the power that God has given to the government to promote justice and to also see that the wrongdoer is punished. And if it's true that the state has the power to bear the sword, that is to bear arms, in order to punish a wrongdoer, it is also by extrapolation valid to insist that the state not only may execute justice on the singular wrongdoer, but upon a collective group of wrongdoers who in evil come against the entity called the state or the government, that is a foreign evil power. A second confusion that I see in the pacifist position is the confusion between internal and external authority. Uh, if God has given the state authority to punish evildoers and given it the power of the sword, then the application of such authority and the sword can be used against those who work evil within the state and from outside the state. However, Sider's position simply indicates that the state has the authority to in a nonviolent way restrain criminals, but basically has not a corresponding ability of the state to defend itself from criminals outside of its midst in foreign nations. The whole idea, too, of being able to restrain criminals with nonviolent techniques is an interesting hypothesis. And I'm not sure how many policemen would want to work or be able to work under those kinds of restraints. I'm not sure that if I had a son in the police force and were to send him into certain areas uh, to, to bring about the enforcement of justice within society and the punishment of the wrongdoer, which are two of the three functions of government, that you can restrain an armed person with 
non-military means. Maybe a whole case could be made for the fact that there is sometimes this un unwise use of arms, but to say simply that the state has no right or authority at all to use arms of any kind, that its resistance to evil must always be non-arms, non-violence, uh, is stretching the point. And as a confusion, I think, between the state's right not only to protect itself in, from internal enemies, but also from external enemies as well. A third confusion, it seems to me, in the pacifist uh, position is uh, the confusion between rehabilitation and retribution. The idea that all punishment should be rehabilitative rather than retributive. Uh, we should uh, never sentence anybody simply because they've done something wrong and say, you serve that amount of time. We should sentence them with the idea of making them better and reformed people. And I agree, that is a very enlightened position. We've been trying it in our prison system. We're supposed to have a rehabilitation system in America, but it isn't working, is it? Um, I wish it were working. It would be a wonderful thing if it worked. Evil is, however, very difficult to educate. And the only way that the gospel recommends is that we convert people. The Bible, however, in talking about judgment, does not just deal with rehabilitative judgment. There is retributive judgment in society at large condoned by God. God did not practice rehabilitative judgment on Noah's world. It was retributive judgment. The world was destroyed. He did not practice rehabilitative judgment on Sodom. It was retributive judgment. Sodom was destroyed. Mosaic fines and the forfeiture of limbs was not involved in rehabilitative justice. It was retributive judgment. The whole Mosaic system was built upon retributive judgment. Jesus gave to Judas a retributive judgment. He went to his own place. Ananias and Sapphira were not given rehabilitative judgment in Acts chapter 5. They were given retributive judgment. And when the devil and his angels and those who have borne the mark of the Antichrist are judged, they are going to be damned, and there will be no rehabilitative judgment. It will be retributive. God himself, at the end of the age, is a retributive judge. So there is nothing immoral or unchristian or wrong in retributive judgment. A fourth confusion in the pacifist uh, approach, and all this ultimately relates to the nuclear issue, because if you're going to start by saying it's wrong, to engage in any nuclear war, then you must back off and begin to, uh, begin to say some other things off of that, like all wars and then all armaments. There is a confusion also between, in the pacifist position, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the pacifist basically ignores the Old Testament or says, says it's been swallowed up in the New Testament. However, when we look at the Old Testament, we find God even sanctioning war. The pacifist position is that Jesus brought in love and used non-military solutions. However, Jesus himself told Pilate that his authority to govern came from him. Neither John the Baptist nor Jesus nor the apostles are ever recorded as telling a military person to leave the military. If indeed Jesus and the apostles were committed totally to a non-military, non-armament approach, it would have been a condition found in the New Testament that centurions, and there are many centurions represented in the New Testament, and other soldiers would have been told as a condition of their discipleship to disarm. Further, Jesus indicates that all of human history, until he comes, will be marked by wars and rumors of wars, with ethnic group rising against ethnic group and political alliance or kingdom against political alliance, kingdom. Ultimately, Jesus himself will return. And what is going to happen when Jesus returns? With justice, he judges and makes war. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. The armies of heaven are following him. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. The problem with the Christian pacifist view of Jesus is that it is one-dimensional. It only focuses upon Jesus' love. It does not focus upon the administration of his justice, nor the upholding by his own power the moral authority that is in the universe. And the New Testament is replete with illustrations that Jesus is not only the lover of the world, but he is the judge of the world as well. The fifth confusion, I think, within the pacifist 
camp is the confusion between love and wrath, the basic position that Jesus only loves and therefore no expression of military resistance or arms bearing which would enforce the judgment of the state, wrath upon it is allowed. At the cross, Jesus did show us in a way that no tongue can ever tell the love of God by his non-resistance to evil. But Jesus' love on the cross is not at that even the full story of the cross. For the Father carried out the sentence of death upon the Son. And in the cross is not only God's love, but God's justice reflected, that God is committed to justice. And because he was committed to justice, he executed judgment upon his Son, who stood in our place. There is a death threat hanging over the whole human race. And the death threat is not the nuclear threat. It is the death threat, the soul that sins shall die. God is going to carry out that threat on all who do not get within the cross. The Christian, therefore, has a double calling to proclaim the love of God and the justice of God. And any position which purports to be the Christian position and only talks about God's love and never talks about his judgment or his justice is a one-dimensional, one-sided, and incomplete view of Jesus. The sixth confusion that I see is the confusion between the role of man in ending planet Earth and the role of God. Ultimately, the scriptures teach us men can do only what God permits and men must live within the limits of God's sovereignty. Our approach, therefore, to the nuclear issue needs to be informed by the clear, and I underline the word clear because there are many aspects of prophetic teaching that aren't clear. And you all that have had courses with me in Revelation where we've argued pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, and my position of pan-trib, which is everything is going to pan out all right, know that there's a great deal of latitude when we talk about prophetic traditions and teachings. But there is clear prophetic teaching in Scripture. And as Christians living in a nuclear age, we need to rely upon what God tells us in His Word. And it seems to me when you look clearly at that word, you have some very clear direction about what God is going to allow and what he is not going to allow. Clear prophetic teaching, and there are several things I want to point out in this relationship, this confusion between man's role and God's role that exists in the pacifist camp, because the pacifist camp is just certain that man, some irrational person or some computer machine is going to malfunction and ignite the world and end it all or end, end civilization as we know it. If you look carefully, though, at clear prophetic teaching in the Scripture, I think you can see and be committed to these points. First of all, God has reserved for himself the right to destroy the world by fire. God has reserved that right for himself. I knew that as an eight-year-old living in Pitcairn, Pennsylvania, when we would have mock nuclear uh, bomb shelter uh, exercises in the schoolyard. And I lived back in those days when they had these marvelous metal cylinders that went up to the second and third story of the schoolyard and the kids would go out a little trap door and slide down the cylinders and get to ground level and then flee down to the basement. And, of course, the school was just two doors from my house, and so after school, we'd always go out and play in those things. And they're a reminder to me of the nuclear age, those crazy metal cylinders I used to slide down and grease with wax paper so they would slide better. But I even knew at that age what the scriptural teaching was on the fact that God had reserved for himself the right to destroy the world by fire. Look with me for a moment at 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, the apostle is contrasting the first judgment of the world, which was by water, and the judgment which is coming. And in verse 7, he says, By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And then down to verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. 
Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. What is amazing about that scripture is that from the first century point of view, there was no fire that could destroy the elements. There was no fire that could be started on earth that would destroy the earth. All human fires at that time ultimately burned out. They might even cover a million acres, but they burned out. Peter, through the Spirit, sees that there is coming a time, really foresaw the nuclear age. But God himself is the possessor of the nuclear secret. And he knew it long before man discovered either fusion or fission. Using the motif of the city of Babylon, which represents in Revelation the city of man in contrast to the city of God, John goes on to show us the destruction of the earth, again, not by man, but by God. Revelation chapter 18, verses 21 through 24. And you can, in reading these scriptural passages, see the after effects of God's nuclear day. With such violence, or let me back off to verse, the start of verse 21. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such violence the great city of Babylon, that is the city of man, will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, flute players and trumpeteers will never be heard in you again. No workman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's great men. By your magic spell all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all who have been killed on the earth. And after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah. So God has reserved the nuclear destruction of this age for himself. It's not man, and no man is going to do it. Or the scripture is not telling us the truth, in which case we ought to chuck being Christians and join the peace movement. I've said that a little ironically, but you can be a Christian and be a part of the peace movement as well. Hopefully we're all for the peace movement. We're just concerned about what's the best way to bring peace. The second uh, thing that seems to me uh, the scriptures tell us about the nuclear age and help clear up the confusion between man's role and God's role is that the destruction of the world by fire cannot occur until the Antichrist has been revealed and judged either at the end of the tribulation or some would say at the end of the millennium. For the Antichrist to be revealed, there must be a world civilization in place with a functioning economy. Israel needs to be in the land. You can be assured that if the United States is destroyed in a nuclear holocaust, that Israel will be destroyed as well. And if Israel is destroyed, there cannot be the setting for the end time events of the tribulation period. A third thing I think we need to keep in mind in regard to God's role in man's is that nuclear war may occur in the tribulation. Limited nuclear war may occur, but the final holocaust, again, is reserved for God's action when he destroys the world by fire. There is a reference in Revelation chapter 8 to a sequence of judgments which occur evidently at the beginning of the tribulation period called the first four trumpets. When a third of the trees and of the earth's grass, a third of its sea, is turned into blood and a third of its sea creatures are killed, a third of the ships are destroyed, a third of the earth, fresh water becomes bitter, and a third of the heavens with the moon, the stars, and the sun failing to give their light are also affected. That may describe a nuclear holocaust that is, occurs on a limited nuclear war basis in the early days or years of the tribulation period. But on the other hand, these plagues sound more like they are modeled after the plagues that broke out on Egypt rather than nuclear exchanges, so it is not even certain that the tribulation period itself calls for a nuclear limited exchange. Then a fourth thing we need to say is 
just to repeat, that in order for the tribulation to begin, world civilization and world culture needs to be in place, not devastated as we would have if we had an all-out or even a limited nuclear war. The Bible, in talking to us of the tribulation period, speaks to us of global communication, an international ID system, a world economy, a united world religious system, and a united world political system in a very thriving and mass situation. In fact, the Antichrist emerges from the sea, the teeming, restless sea of humanity. That is not the kind of civilization that can exist after the United States and Russia have dropped their bombs on one another. I think that the, the evangelical Christian here has something going for him as a perspective on the nuclear age that no one else outside of Christ has, and that is the clear prophetic word of Scripture. Some final comments, and then we're done. Some responses to the peace issue and to nuclear deterrence. I think one response I need to take as an individual Christian is not to fear those who hold the nuclear weapons, but to fear God. Jesus himself said it eloquently, Matthew 10, 28, and his words are binding upon us. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The real issue confronting our day is not the issue of the nuclear war. It is the issue of meeting God unprepared. Jesus says that is when you should be afraid if you're unprepared to meet him. A second response we need to take is to pray for those in positions of leadership and responsibility in the government. We need to hold our president, the Congress, the judicial and executive branches up before God in prayer, interceding, as Paul tells us in the Timothy letter, that we might pray for these persons in order to live godly and peaceful lives. A third thing we need to do is encourage the promotion of justice within governments and to resist evil. Alexander Solzhenitsyn has given us an excellent perspective on how to do that. It's interesting that someone who comes out of that system would not identify with the pacifist position. A fourth position that we need to take is to pray for peace, and especially, I think, to hear the scriptural admonition to pray for the peace of Jerusalem because the real center of future world history is not going to be what happens in New York or Moscow or even Washington, D.C. It's going to be what happens in Jerusalem. And when Jerusalem and Zion is in peace, the world will be at peace. I think a fifth response is that we need to express solidarity with the suffering church. It is the presence, perhaps, of the Western church, the church living in the free world, that is able to give, at times, the, the pressure that is needed to keep even a crack of religious liberty open for the Eastern Church. We need to express our solidarity with them. It is regrettable that a group of church men from America would have been in Moscow two weeks ago and never said a word about religious oppression when the president of France had the courage coming from a, even a non-Christian context to in a public banquet talk about human rights. Another thing that we need to do is to proclaim and demonstrate the truth and the love of God in our daily life. Ray Stedman, pastor of Peninsula Bible Church in Palo Alto, I think wraps it up best in his sermon on the Christian and the nuclear issue. If you want to do something about nuclear war, and it is perfectly understandable that you should, then my advice would be don't waste time joining demonstrations. The same amount of effort put into bearing witness of the peace and joy that knowledge of the Savior brings, offering comfort and strength in the midst of trials, and demonstrating Christian love to those who are hurting and suffering around us, as well as defending the righteous actions of legislators and Christian leaders in politics, is far more effective than negative protests. That's all I have to say for tonight on that issue. Let's pray. We realize, Lord, that we live in an increasingly complex world, as Ken Wayman prayed this morning, and that the issues facing our generation are issues never faced by any other generation in human history. We recognize, Lord, the profound changes, and we're taught by you to read the signs of the times. 
and that as the age picks up in its intensity toward war and its, and its destructive potential, we're taught to begin to look up, to lift up our head, for our redemption draws nigh. We pray for our country and we pray, Lord, that people all over the world would have the privilege of having the same freedom of speech and thought and inquiry and faith as we have. We would pray, Lord, that for people living in under any totalitarian regime, whether it's right or left, would experience the glorious liberty of the sons of God in their internal life, regardless of the political repression, and that through the power of the Christian presence, there would be a voice in the world for true peace. We pray, Lord, for President Reagan, for his advisors, for the Congress, that in our country debates, decides these issues. None of us have access to the information they're working with or to those kinds of military secrets. We can ask, O oh Lord, alone that you give them wisdom and that you give them insight and most of all, you give them your heart so that they will understand how your character should be at work in their life in ministering to the needs within the human community for both love and justice. We ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen.